what to say, Lord God. May we truly believe, may we truly have honor, may we truly have respect for your word this morning and know that what, what's being taught to us needs to be applied to our lives. God, I thank you so much for this church. I thank you so much for what you're building, the people that you're bringing in. Uh, God, I thank you that uh, you're using who you're using, Lord God. I'm humbled that you continue to use me uh, every day, Lord God. I pray that you'll continue to give everybody confidence to know that they can be used. They are, they are valuable to your kingdom. They have a purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to John chapter 4, if you will. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> John chapter 4. One of the hardest things to do is get ready to preach while our worship team worships because I can't focus on what I'm trying to focus on because the worship is so good. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> we started a series a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, called Failing Forward. That's our theme for this year. How to deal with failure in your life, uh, not as a finality, but as uh, something that is a lesson learned, something that can help you grow and become more than what you are right now. <clears throat> I told you that after we got through the introduction, we were going to start doing character studies on different characters from the Bible. We're going to be looking at um, different individuals and, and their lives and their struggles and how they struggled with life, and how they failed forward. Today, our first character study uh, begins with uh, this story in John chapter 4. It's a long uh, passage. We'll read all this lesson and uh, message. And the way we're going to look at it is we're going to look at the first part, the failing part of the lives of these individuals, how they failed, where, where they failed. Listen, I think one of the greatest mistakes we make and one of the greatest, um, I can't even think of the word I want, one, one of the biggest mistakes we make in our lives is not admitting our failures. Remember, we talked about that in the introductory message to this series. We don't in, we, we're afraid to admit that we failed. We're, fa we're afraid to take responsibility for our failures. The only way you're going to learn and grow from failure is to accept, admit it, and then try to learn from it. So we're going to spend the first part of the messages on these studies looking at the failures of the individuals and then looking, how they, looking at how they use those failures in their lives to fail forward and become more than what they were. But let's go ahead and read John chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing, making more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if, if you only knew the gift of God, the, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you were speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water that he and his sons and his animals enjoyed. Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will, be, will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I will give them, uh, I give, will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter 
whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. For the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then, the disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God you, uh, who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months plant, uh, between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvester paid good wage, harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest, you didn't plant, others had already done the work, and now you will get out of the harvest. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the one said he did everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in so he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. A couple uh, quotes about failure. Francis Chan, uh, added to a quote by William Carey, said this, our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of, of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. And the famous quote goes like this, failures are a part of life. If you don't fail, you don't learn. If you don't learn, you'll never change. And Winston Churchill made this famous statement about failure. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. We're talking about failing forward. Using those failures in your life, those things that are sometimes massive disappointments, things that uh, seemingly halt you where you're at, things, things that stop your progress, and things that may seem in your life that they are forever going to change the way you live. But we're looking at them not from the idea that they are final, but they are learning exercises, opportunities to help us become more of what we can be for Jesus Christ. And let me just make a couple caveats here this morning. This is a very tough message. I'm going to be very honest with you. It's a very tough message. Uh, the things that this woman failed at in her life, I'm not going to pull any punches. I'm going to be very honest about it. Because as we look at our society today, we see a lot of people that would fall into this category. It's brutal. Life can be brutal sometimes. Life can be difficult. And many of you right here have stopped yourself in growth. Have stopped yourself in becoming more than what you think you should be and what you can be for Jesus Christ because of failures of your past. Please listen to this message as I preach it. Some of the things I say may offend you. Okay. It happened. Don't let them. Learn from them. Listen to them. Some of this might hurt because it hits very close to home. Let it. Because in order for us to grow, in order for us to move forward in our lives, we've got to be able to take the bandage off of our wounds. We've got to be willing to massage those scars and revisit the pain that brought those about so that we can learn the lessons from them and move forward and become more of who Jesus Christ has called us to be. 
Failing forward is not just a catchy phrase. Failing forward is the idea of allowing the failures of your life to serve a purpose, the intended purpose, a purpose of making your walk with Jesus Christ that much greater and that much stronger. You have no idea what Jesus Christ wants to do with your life. You have no idea what he can do with your life. Some of you have such a cloud of your past around you, have such a cloud of your failures around you, that you're not allowing him to show you just what he wants you to do. One of the things I always try to share with people that I'm mentoring in ministry is this. Don't ever look at the small picture. You have to deal with the small picture of life, no doubt about it. You have to deal with the situation that is in front of you right now. But if you allow the small picture to dictate the way you're going to think and the way you're going to feel and the way you're going to uh, walk with Jesus Christ, then you're never going to get beyond the small picture. You have to be able to look at the big picture of life and ministry and try to figure out through the power of God as you pray and ask for his wisdom where this all fits in. Because make no mistake, every situation, every issue that comes up in your life, every struggle that you go through, every struggle that you help others go through has been brought in your life and allowed in your life for the purpose of making you stronger and better in the big picture. If we get caught up in the small stuff of life, if we allow the distractions of life to take our focus away from what we are called to do, which is reach people with the gospel and live a life that honors him, then we're always going to be spinning our wheels, sitting exactly where we're at and never moving forward. That's what this series is about. Failing forward. Learning from your past. Learning from your mistakes. We need to understand that failure isn't the end. Failure doesn't define your life. And that God can use anything he chooses to teach us how to be better followers of his and move us forward. If we were to jump all the way to the end of this story... Understand this, many people from this Samaritan village came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they did so because of a woman whose life, and we've got to be honest, up to this point was a miserable failure. Because she kept searching, seeking, and moving forward, great things were done for the kingdom of God. You've got to be able to look forward and see what God wants to do and what God can do with you forward towards the mark. In this account of scripture, which is a real life story, this is not a parable. The prodigal son is a parable. The prodigal son is a story that Jesus used uh, to make his point. This is a real life story. This woman literally existed. This town literally existed. This woman was real. This conversation that Jesus had was a real conversation. What we read here is an actual account of Jesus Christ meeting a seeker and bringing them to faith in himself. We have an encounter of failure meeting the grace of God and grace winning the day. As we'll see in this account, encounters with Jesus can occur in our everyday lives. It doesn't have to be a special service. It doesn't have to be a special circumstance. In fact, more times than not, the ministry, your performance, why I, why I try to uh, get the thought across that life is ministry and ministry is life. That every day you have the opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ with someone. Every day. Every day you have the opportunity through your everyday life to help build the kingdom of God. The mundane routine that we go through can be something that Jesus uses to speak to us, to reach out to us, and to teach us. Now, before we get into the woman's failures, there's some very interesting and unique aspects story that I want to point out to you. The first one is this. It's the longest one-on-one -on -one conversation that is recorded of Jesus and an individual. Now, that may not seem like a big deal because some conversation that he has has to be the longest, right? So this just has, happens to be one. As I give you these other facts about this conversation, understand why that, see, why that is very, very important. John is the only writer that records this encounter. Jesus, as if you remember from the story that we just read, Jesus addresses a woman all alone. No others are around and no husband is present. That was completely against 
the, 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 uh, the ways of the day, completely against the societal norms at that time. A man did not speak to a woman in public alone unless her husband was present. She didn't have a husband, you, and you didn't know that. You still didn't speak to the woman alone. So this is very unique that Jesus actually spoke to this woman all by herself. Rabbis were not supposed to speak to women of questionable reputations. Jesus was a teacher of the Jews. This woman uh, will see, and you say, well, why was she a woman of, of questionable reputation? Well, we'll see what her, what her life was, where her failings were. The biggest, area, the biggest way you know that this woman was an outcast in her community is that she was drawing water at that time of the day. At that time of the day, it was, normal, it, uh, for, it was not normal for people to draw water. Women who drew the water at that time would go in the morning. They would be there together. It was, almost a so, it was like a social gathering. But women would come together and do that. This woman came by herself at that time of day because she was an outcast. She was a Samaritan, and the Samaritans were looked down upon, very racist issues between the Israelites and the Samaritans. Samaritans were, were seen by the Jews as less than them. So here's a woman an, uh, who was from an outcast group, and she's an outcast among, that own, uh, among her own group of outcasts. She was way down the list. In this story, we see the hypostatic union on display. The hypostatic union is a theological term, which means that Jesus, when he came down to earth, was all God and all man. Jesus took on humanity, but he never laid aside his godliness. He still had all the power, all the knowledge, all the wisdom, all the abilities of God he just took on human form. How do we know that? Well, the Bible tells us that he was tired and thirsty. Very human, very human aspects. Shows us that Jesus Christ truly was a man. But also, we see his godhood in the fact that without even knowing this woman, he knew everything about her. He never met her before. Her name isn't even recorded. Yet Jesus knew everything about her. So you see that he was all God and all man. And here's something I thought was very unique that when I, the first time I read this. This is the first time that Jesus reveals himself by personal declaration that he is the Messiah. There are those who tell you who don't believe. There are different uh, churches, different religious groups that don't believe Jesus Christ is God. They believe that there's God the Father and Jesus Christ is his son and they're not the same. Jesus Christ, there's, we believe in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three in one, three, three separate personalities, one God. Jesus here, and they, and they say, they'll tell you that uh, Jesus never claimed to be God. Absolutely wrong, absolutely wrong. Right here, Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. He said, I am the one that I'm talking about. He doesn't make this decree to impress he doesn't do it to take over. He doesn't use it as an edict to overthrow, overthrow a government or an established religion. He simply says it to make the point. And he makes this declaration to an outcast woman who is an enemy of his people. And if you want to make a societal uh, statement here, this is a death blow to the, to the idea of racism, racial hatred, and division. We divide ourselves, you know, the, 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 the modern terminology now is tribes, right? We divide ourselves among tribes. But we do that in church as well. And we have black churches, we have white churches, we have Spanish churches, we have Russian churches, we have this. And I get it when it's divided among language. If you speak a different language, I get that. But folks, right here, Jesus is taking his truth to a woman of a different race. Never, ever, ever should we make, try, even try to make the case that Jesus divides us and has a different level of love for people of different colored skin. This statement right here, this act of Jesus, is a death blow to the idea of racism. 
All of these are great lessons or facts from which we can learn strong principles. But that isn't the focus of our story or of our message. What is our focus is this woman, her failures, and how she failed forward in spite of all that she had done. Make no mistake, this woman wasn't just a failure in the, in the opinion of others. She was a failure in life for some very valid and painful reasons. Her life choices had brought her to the point of being an outcast among a society of outcasts. But even though her life had been defined by failure, she wasn't. Remember, that was one of the points we brought out last week. Just because her life was defined by failures doesn't mean that she was. Don't ever let failure define you as a failure. She didn't. And in this message, I want to show you why. But first, let's look at her failures and see what she was up against. The point here is not of this message. Let me say this. The point is not to show how bad somebody is. The point is not to make you feel bad about your life. The point is not to make you feel like the scum of the earth or less than anybody else. The point of this idea, the point of this story and the reason why we're looking at it is because we need to see that God and his grace is stronger and greater than our mistakes. Some of you, let's be honest, you're struggling in life right now. You're struggling with decisions. You're struggling with a lot of different things. Some of you are struggling in your marriage. Your marriages are, are hurting. Some of you are struggling with children. Those of you who have teenagers, I'm telling you, military school. <laughs> Works every time. Works every time. Some of you are struggling with, if you're choosing your own path in life, you are choosing against the leading of the Spirit of God in your life. Some of you have given up on certain things. It just doesn't matter. We're going to get to that in the second point. You have no right to give up on something if God says don't give up on it. Some of you say it's just easier to walk this way. It's just easier not to make waves. It's just easier for me not to battle that. I can set that aside. I can put that away, and I can just walk forward. You have no right to do that if you're, if you're calling yourself someone who truly wants to follow Jesus Christ and live by the Spirit. Listen, folks, it is time that we get back to what the Bible says is Christian living, is godly morality. He goes on. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law, speaking of the law of Moses. Now, I pointed out the, I pointed out the, um, got an unhappy camper here. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, I pointed out what this woman's moral failing is. But I also said this, that that is not the only moral failure. See, we as Christians and as churches, we want to pick out those things that we want to be against. I've said before, years ago, I, I would not, it wouldn't be that I couldn't be your pastor. I couldn't even be a member of a church, an evangelical church. Why? Because I'm a divorced man. And years ago, probably 20 years ago, there are some churches still today, the more uh, hardcore um, fundamentalist style churches who still won't allow divorced people to become members of their church. Listen, that's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. So when we look at morality, it's not, it's not what we think. It's not our, our own standards. It's what the Bible has to say. And we can pick and choose and we pick on people. Sometimes we pick on them because it's easy. Their sin is obvious. I've talked to pastors before um, big thing in churches is if a, young, if a teenage girl gets pregnant out of wedlock, they have to get up and apologize to the church. Oh, move on, pastor. Come on, get a life. That's just so not even in scripture. You're, you're just totally, you know why? And I've asked people, why do you do that? Why don't you, why don't you make the guy that went out Friday night and got drunk and got a DUI? Why don't you make him get up there and apologize to the church? Oh, because her sin is obvious. Okay, okay. So you're making up your own rules as you go along. That's what you're doing. That's exactly what you're doing. We don't have the right to pick and choose who we think is unworthy of the grace of God. We don't have the right to pick and choose 
who we make an example of. It is not your job, Christian, to make an example of anybody. It is your job to live a morally pure and ethically pure life before God and this world. It is not your job to point anybody out and point out any... There is not a person in this auditorium that can say, Pastor John came to me and told me I was wrong for what I was doing. Because that's not my job. But I can tell you this, the Bible is very clear on what it means to be a moral, ethical Christian. And we see a list here in the rest of Galatians chapter 5. Verse 20, the, uh, verse 19. The acts of the flesh are, ob are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry, that doesn't mean simply that you have a totem pole in your living room. That means that that car that you spend all your extra money on and you can't give to the kingdom of God and the work of God, that you have to have those rims, you have to have that paint job, that car is an idol in your life because it's becoming, it's coming before God and before God's purpose and plan in your life. Idolatry, witchcraft, and those are tough, man. Those are big ones, right? We don't want a witch coming in here. We don't. And I don't husbands, I don't want to hear anything about your wife. <laughs> We don't have a parking spot for brooms. Uh, uh, trying to lighten the mood. Lighten up, folks. Come on. Those are big ones, man. Those are tough ones, right? Those are, the, those are like, yes, yes. Those are, that's the important stuff. That's what we're talking about. All right, let's go on in the list, shall we? Hatred. Did you know hatred is immoral? Did you know that, that hatred is immoral? I had a person of color say to me one day, I hate white people. I hate people just like you. I've, I have heard so many people in my life, white people say, I can't stand black people. They fill in the blank. I, around here, it's, I can't stand Puerto Ricans. There's Puerto Ricans, oh my goodness. Oh, blah, blah, blah. You know it as well as I do. Why can't I just speak truth? in church. Of all places, let's just speak truth, right? You know it. You know that's what goes on. Did you know, Christian, that that is a b unbelievably immoral to have that kind of an attitude? It is immoral and against the plan of God for your life to think that just because your skin is different or you speak a different language or you don't speak with a certain accent or that you don't like rice and beans and somebody else does that you're a better person than they are, and that God shines his light brighter on you. You're absolutely wrong, and you, my friend, are in sin because you are acting immorally. It goes on. Discord. Did you know that if you are a person who causes strife intentionally to divide other people, you are an immoral person in the eyes of God? Why do you think Paul spent so much time in his epistles writing about being unified in the church? Because God looks at those who create discord in the church as immoral. Learn how to get along, folks. We put more responsibility on our children to get along with each other than we do on ourselves. Learn how to get along with people. We've got to hurry here. Discord. Jealousy. Fits of rage. Selfish ambitions. Dissensions factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. That's what the Bible says is immoral. Those are the things the Bible says are immoral. Yeah, we look at the big sins, right? We look at those sins that, that uh, in, in fact, remember when, uh, I don't know, I don't think they are anymore, but remember when the, the higher taxes on cigarettes and alcohol was called the sin tax? Those of you who are older, you remember, remember be calling, the, calling it the sin tax? How about if you had to pay extra taxes? Or how about here, if, if in our church, you had to throw an extra dollar in the plate every time you showed hatred towards somebody? We call it a sin tax in church. And not, isn't that something in, in the English, the sin tax? Yeah, don't ask me what it is, but spelled differently. Anyway, but how about that? How about if every time you acted immorally, in violation of 
what the Bible says is morality. Hating somebody. Gossiping. Being jealous of somebody else's position in the church. Jealous. Do you know jealousy is immorality, according to God? How about every time that happens, God thumps you on the skull spiritually? Like you, not anymore. We don't do those things to children anymore, right? Bless their little hearts. Uh, I have a pers- permanent divot in the back of my head. Boom. Anybody else get their hands smacked at the dinner table if they did something? With, I, my dad used to use a, the butter knife. What? You ever had a butter knife on the knuckles? That's why my hand goes like this today. <laughs> what if God did that to you every time you acted immorally in his service? An intentional violation of his word is sin. James 4, 17, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. God gives clear teaching on how to be moral in his eyes. Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart and do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my, pla- unto my path. Listen, it's not my job to tell anyone how to live. It's not my business. But it's time that we stop pretending that God doesn't have standards for morality and ethics and his people. And it's time we started living his word. That's when people, hey, listen, folks, when you stop, at, when you stop making excuses for why you do what you do and you start accepting the fact that God does have moral standards for you as his child, that's when people will start taking you seriously in your faith. That's when they'll start taking you seriously in your faith. Secondly, here we go. She had failed at marriage and relationships. Her first failure was at morality. Her second failure was at marriage and relationships. So much so that she had given up on marriage altogether. And she was now, after five failed marriages, she was now living with a guy. She had given up on marriage altogether. Marriage is the foundation of the family that God has established. Let me say this. Before before I I catch flack on this, before you get upset, let me say this. Not everybody has to get married. Not everybody needs to be married. It may not be God's plan for you to ever get married. God may have called you to a life of singlehood. That's fine. You may have been married. You may have had a failed marriage, a, a, a marriage that went under. And that may have have made it for you that you never want to get married again. You don't have to. The marriage, according to the word of God, marriage is the foundation of a society. And it's the foundation of the family. And it's the foundation of the church. But it doesn't mean single moms and single dads that you can't be a great parent. Listen, I know some families that are better off, some children that are better off in their lives with just one parent than the two parents together because the two parents together are like TNT, right? It's like uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima with those two parents get together. And it's better for that child to be all alone. I'm not saying you have to be married. What I'm saying is what this woman had done is she had failed so much at marriage that she had given up on the idea of it. It's still God's plan. Even though it may not be God's plan for you, it's still God's plan. And what is under assault in our society today is the foundation of marriage as the foundation of a society. So much so that it's crept into churches and churches don't preach that marriage is God's plan. Listen, just because we don't, uh, just because we don't, do certain things or say certain things doesn't mean that the Bible isn't saying what the Bible says. What's the whole idea of this? That everybody needs to go out and get married? No. That just because you failed at something in your life does not mean you give up on what God's plan is for that, no matter what it is. No matter what it is. We're created for relationships. It's the pattern of growth and productivity. See, it's not just the marriage relationship we're talking about. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Some of you have failed, have had such failed relationships, not marriage relationships, and not, not um, uh, relationships, romantic relationships, just friendships. 
If I were to have you raise your hands right now, I bet almost everybody in this auditorium would raise their hand and say, at some point in my life, I've been burned and, and uh, stabbed in the back and betrayed by a friend. Just about every one of us would be able to say that. Make sure that you don't allow that failure in relationships to have you give up on relationships altogether. Because relationships build lives and relationships build churches. And that's God's plan for each and every one of us. Her attitude towards marriage, her attitude towards relationships is understandable. It's understandable, but it's not acceptable according to the word of God. Violating God's word because you failed or because it's too difficult is never acceptable. Why? Because this would be accepting failure. Philippians 1.6 says, And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. And lastly, she failed at owning her own issues. She failed at marriage. She failed at morality. She failed at marriage. But lastly, man, she failed at owning her own issues. Outside of Christian music, my favorite band of all time is the Eagles. Got any Eagles fans here? Yeah, go Eagles. Eagles, yeah. <laughs> Whew, love the Eagles. Not the football team, relax. <laughs> the group, okay? When the Eagles came out of retirement, and started back up, started the group back up again. They put out a new album called Hell Freezes Over because people said the Eagles would get back together when Hell Freezes Over, so they got back together. Hell Freezes Over. And one of the songs on that album is called Get Over It, right? And it was written, if you guys know this, Get Over It, it was written at a time when Jerry Springer show was out and all these shows where people got, went on TV with their problems. Listen, man, don't ever show your f again if you. If you're like, that is just insane, right? But they're blaming everybody. They're blaming everybody for their problems. They're blaming everybody for their issues. It's everybody else's fault. Oh, society failed. Oh, this. Oh, their mother, uh, their mother fed them strained peas. And uh, uh, all this, that, and the other thing. Oh, it's everybody else's fault. Man, Glenn Fry, they wrote that song simply to say, get over it. Stop blaming everybody else for your problems and issues and get over it. Christian, let me tell you something. Some of you cannot move forward in your life because you won't own your own issues. Yes, I know. Listen, sometimes people did things to you. I get that. But it's your life and you have to own it now. It doesn't mean you take responsibility for what was done to you, but it means you take responsibility for getting past that. Does that make sense? You don't take responsibility for the wrong that was done to you because that was wrong. But you do take responsibility for getting over it, to getting, for getting past it, for getting beyond it. Take responsibility for your own life, your own issues. How do we know she failed at owning her issues? When Jesus pointed out the failures in her life, she redirected the conversation away from herself. Well, why is it that you Jews say that we have to worship? Man, we, this went from a personal thing to a a theological conversation in a heartbeat. She redirected. Having and maintaining a personal relationship with Jesus is all about owning your life, your successes, and your failures. Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Nothing in all creation, nothing in all creation Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. He knows it. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows where you're failing. He knows what you don't think. He knows what you're trying to hide. He knows the pain that you deal with. He knows it all. Get over it and move forward. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. And make sure you see you are accountable to God, not anybody else. Romans 14, 11, and 12 back that up. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Listen, you can duck, you can hide, you can try to bury the issues, you can try to shove them to the side, whether it was what somebody else did to you or what you've done to yourself. You can try to push it aside and say it doesn't matter, but it does matter. 
And it matters that you are able to deal with it and get over it and get past it and deal with it with the grace of God. Because someday you're going to have to stand before him and give account of your life. Some of you, you're trying to find Jesus your own way. You're trying to find him your own way. You're making up your own religion as things go along. You're making up your own ideas. That's how we got the idea that we can be good enough to get ourselves to heaven. Somebody didn't like what the Bible said, and they made their own way up as they went along. What does the Bible say about personal responsibility? It says that Jesus died on the cross so that we could own our own lives. So that we would ultimately own the mistakes that we've made. What do you mean by that, Pastor John? I mean this. Before you can ever change anything in your life, before you can ever move forward, before you can ever become a good Christian, before you can ever become a profitable and fruitful Christian, before you can ever fail forward as a Christian, you must become a Christian. Well, I was baptized as a baby into the Christian church. Hey, listen, I'm sorry. If I'm busting your bubble this morning, I'm not doing it out of, uh, out of malice. I'm doing it out, out of what the Bible teaches. That doesn't matter. If you were baptized as a baby, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You won't find that in the Bible. Well, I've lived a good life, and I just believe at some point when I get there, when I stand before God, like we're talking about giving account of my life, God's going to he, have a scale there. That, I mean, that's what I said. St. Peter's going to stand there at the pearly gates, right? And he's got a scale, and my good stuff is going to be on one side, my bad stuff. And as long as my good stuff outweighs my bad stuff, everything's cool. Man, you're not going to get that in the Word of God. It's not there. The Bible says we are all personally accountable to God. And that means you're personally accountable for the most important choice you'll ever make in your life. And that's the choice for or against Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible says this very clearly. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. That's what we're talking about this morning. You can think whatever you want. You cannot like that, that I've talked about failing at morality, failing at marriage. You can think I've overstepped my bounds. That's all up to you. That's, that's your choice to do that. I am very comfortable with what I've preached this morning. But let me tell you something, folks. I'm also comfortable with this. Every one of us in our lives has sinned. We've all done something wrong. It doesn't matter if you stole a candy bar when your dad said not to. It doesn't matter if you called your sister a, a whatever you called her. And your parents told you not to. It doesn't matter if you disobeyed. It doesn't matter if you murdered. It doesn't matter. Sin is sin in the eyes of God. Go back to what we talked about. You don't have a right to your own morality. God says what morality is according to his word. And he says that all of us is sin. It's not, something to, it's not something to single you out. It's something that is true. We've all sinned in the eyes of God. And because of our sin, Romans 6, 23 says, the wages or the payment of sin is death. Spiritually and physically. Bible says because you've sinned and because you have broken that relationship with God, you are condemned to death. And if you died today without a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ in your heart, the Bible says very clearly that it's not a sin to, it, the, these other sins won't put you in hell. What will send you to hell is rejecting Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's very clear in the Word of God. So we see that we're all sinners. And we see that our sin has a price to be paid. And the Bible says very clearly that we can't pay it. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for grace you are saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should brag. Your works cannot get you to heaven. Your works cannot pay the price for your sin. Well, what can? Romans 5, 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Bottom line is, you were the sinner. Jesus died to pay the price for your sins. John 3, 16, for God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You're the one that's wrong. Absolutely. You're the one that's done wrong. We need to own our lives. We need to own our wrongs. You're the one that's wrong in life. You're the one that sinned. 
There's nothing wrong. There's nothing shameful with admitting it. It's the truth. You can't do it. You can't fix your sin problem on your own. You can't do it. But Jesus could. The Bible said Jesus came down to earth, lived 33 years as a man, willingly gave himself to be crucified on the cross. The Bible says that his death paid the price for our sins. One sacrifice for sins forever. For as by one man sin entered into the world, so as by one man shall all sin be taken care of. Jesus paid the price for your sins. Well, well, great. I'm good to go, right? I'm good to go. Not yet. Not yet. If, if all you're counting on is the fact that Jesus died on the cross, then you're wrong. And let me explain that. Because that's all that's necessary for, the sin, for sin to be paid for. But something has to be done on your part. It's like Christmas, Right? Use this illustration every time we talk about this. At Christmas time, I can go out for my wife and I can pick out the perfect present. New pair of glasses, perhaps. I can pick out the perfect present. I can do my dead level best to wrap that thing well, to put a beautiful bow on it. And then, because she is so big on tags on Christmas presents, I can put a tag on that and I can write to the beautiful Aaron from me, from John. That, that gift was bought for Aaron. It was paid for for Aaron. It was wrapped for Aaron. It was, it was written on, and it is Aaron's gift. It is intended for Aaron. But that gift does not become Aaron's until she receives it. Get that? When she takes possession of it, that's when that gift becomes hers. Hey, listen, folks, we are the sinners. We're the ones that have done wrong. We're the ones that were worthy of death. Jesus didn't. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. Yet, the Bible says he willingly came down to earth, lived among us, willingly gave his life to pay the price for our sins. And the price for your sins has been paid. Eternity has been paid for, and it has your name on it. All that's waiting is for you to receive it, to take possession of that gift. The Bible says it's the gift of God. All that's left is for you to take possession, to take ownership of that gift. How do you do that? Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you openly declare that, you're, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I know there are people that say, oh, you know, you, you, you fundamentalists, all you, or you evangelicals, all you think you have to do is say a, a simple prayer. Listen, man, a simple prayer is not what it is. It is not what it's all about. The prayer is, it's having a conversation with God and accepting his gift. So get over yourself. You have to pray and talk to God to accept it, right? So yeah, you need to pray. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've never made that commitment and said, okay, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm the one that's wrong. I can't do anything about it, but you died on the cross for my sins. I get that now. I own it. And I know you died to pay the price for my sins, and I know that I must accept it in order for it to be mine. Now you're ready to say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. And based on the word of God and based on your faith in belief in that simple prayer of acceptance, the Bible says you will become a Christian. You will become a follower of Jesus. You will become a child of God. What's the difference between you now and you then? Accepting it. Accepting it. Voicing that prayer. I can know all day that the cure to cancer sits in this bottle. But until I take it, the cancer will never go away. You've got to follow through. You've got to go that last step. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house today. Thank you, Lord, so much for, um, for what you've done. Thank you for your...